Welcome. I'm Eric Fleming, host of A Moment with Eric Fleming, the podcast of our time. I want to personally thank you for listening to the podcast. If you like what you're hearing, then I need you to do a few things. First, I need subscribers. I'm on Patreon at patreon.com slash a moment with Eric Fleming. Your subscription allows an independent podcaster like me the freedom to speak truth to power and to expand and improve the show. Second, leave a five-star review for the podcast on the streaming service you listen to it. That will help the podcast tremendously. Third, go to the website, momenteric.com. There you can subscribe to the podcast, leave reviews and comments, listen to past episodes, and even learn a little bit about your host. Lastly, don't keep this a secret like it's your own personal guilty pleasure. Tell someone else about the podcast. Encourage others to listen to the podcast and share the podcast on your social media platforms because it is time to make this moment a movement. Thanks in advance for supporting the podcast of our time. I hope you enjoy this episode as well. to another moment with Eric Fleming. I am your host, Eric Fleming. And let me just say to everybody listening, Happy New Year. It is now 2024. Buckle up, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> We're going to be in for a ride. Uh, but we're going to do this show throughout 2024 to make that ride a little smoother and to give us hope and give us energy to do what we need to do uh, in November of 2024. And this episode, we've got some guests that we're going to highlight some good things that are going on uh, and some good people that are doing good work. So I hope that you sit back and listen and enjoy this episode but before we get into all that, it's time for a moment of news with Grace G. Thanks, Eric. Michigan Supreme Court declined to hear a case that sought to disqualify former President Donald Trump from the state's presidential primary ballot. The U.S. Supreme Court declined to immediately rule on Donald Trump's claim that he cannot be prosecuted for trying to overturn his 2020 election defeat, allowing a lower court to continue reviewing the issue. Rudy Giuliani filed for bankruptcy after being ordered to pay $148 million to two former Georgia election workers he falsely accused of fraud following Donald Trump's 2020 presidential election loss. A New Hampshire man has been indicted for threatening the lives of three U.S. presidential candidates via text messages. President Joe Biden reduced the prison terms of 11 people serving long sentences for nonviolent drug charges and pardoned potentially thousands of others with federal or Washington, D.C. marijuana possession offenses. President Biden signed the U.S. Defense Policy Bill, authorizing a record $886 billion in annual military spending, which includes aid for Ukraine and policies against China. Three Tacoma, Washington policemen were acquitted of homicide charges in the 2020 killing of Manuel Ellis, a black man whose death paralleled the murder of George Floyd. Two Colorado paramedics were found guilty of criminally negligent homicide for their role in the 2019 death of Elijah McClain, a young black man who died after they injected him with a powerful sedative. The Wisconsin Supreme Court ordered the Republican-controlled state legislature to redraw legislative maps. Rapper Ye, formerly known as Kanye West, issued an apology in Hebrew to the Jewish community for his past anti-Semitic remarks. U.S. prices fell in November for the first time in over three years, pushing the annual increase in inflation below 3 percent, and U.S. retail sales rose 3.1 percent between November 1st and December 24th. I am Grace G., and this has been a Moment of News.
All right. Thank you, Grace, and Happy New Year to you. And now it is time for our first guest. And I'm going to have two ladies coming on first uh, to discuss the nuances of space law. And I think you're going to find this conversation really, really interesting. So let me go ahead and introduce our, our guest. First guest is Ravimbo Samanga. And she is a space policy analyst and sits on the board of the Space Arbitration Association. Ravimbo has supported a number of international initiatives in policy, business, outreach, and education geared toward the advancement of space and satellite applications for sustainable development. She currently serves as an ambassador for the Milo Space Science Institute and previously served a two-year term as the national point of contact for Zimbabwe in the Space Generation Advisory Council, the latter which is in support of the United Nations Program on Space Applications. She has been recognized as an African space leader, an emerging space leader, and a young space leader for her efforts. Joining her is a young lady named Bailey Reichelt. Bailey is a founding partner of Aegis Space Law, a boutique firm centered around assisting startups and tech entrepreneurs in in navigating the complexities of federal regulations. Her primary focus is designing and implementing cutting-edge international trade compliance programs, as well as helping clients to develop effective long-term regulatory strategies to take them from incorporation to successful mission execution. Bailey is also an instructor for the Export Compliance Training Institute and on the board of directors for the Association of Commercial Space Professionals. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor and privilege to have as a guest, as guest, excuse me, on this program, Ruvimbo Samanga and Bailey Reichel. All right, Ruvimbo Samanga. And Bailey Reichelt. How y'all doing? Good, thanks. How are you? I'm doing lovely. Doing lovely. Um, uh, Honored to have y'all on because I I like to have people smarter than me on the podcast, right? And uh, I am banking on the fact that y'all are really key experts on the topic we're going to discuss, which is space law. Uh, and so what I like to do with, with the guests is I usually throw out a quote that either maybe something they said or something related to the work that they are doing and just kind of want to get your feedback off of it. And it doesn't, mit- it doesn't matter which one of you two, you know, jump on it or in, in this case, or, uh, speaks first, um, it, it, you know, and both of y'all can respond to it. So here's your quote. I think we are at the dawn of a new era in commercial space exploration. And I'll qualify that by saying Elon Musk said that. So what y'all take on that particular quote? Well, I'll I'll go first if you don't mind, Ruvimbo. Uh, it, it's true, and we are in a new dawn. And I am 34 years old, but in the last 10 years since I saw my first launch, when ULA was the kind of and the government were the only ones launching, we have seen SpaceX do reusable launch and reentry. Where I remember everyone gathered around the computer watching the first time they did it and cheering. You know, all over the country, all the space nerds were glued to computers watching the live stream. And we saw the explosions and everything. And now uh, you can go to a launch, you know, once or twice a month and see this happen. It's become normal and people have lost interest and it's not news anymore. 
one of the amazing things is when something stops being news and you've normalized it, you've truly made progress. You've made progress in safety. Think about, you know, the aviation industry and how we just take it for granted now. The more we get to that point, where space is just so part of our lives that we're taking much of the technological progress for granted, that's really something we should stop and think, wow, we have come a long way from you know, the Apollo era where astronauts died regularly to now this is a form of transportation that doesn't get a whole lot of interest in the news. So I'll leave it there for Ruvimbo to respond. I'd like to jump in and qualify what Bailey has just mentioned, which is we're moving away from space being a history that's being narrated to us, especially as emerging nations, but an actual you know, development that we can all participate in. And if you see just how rapidly space has taken off in Africa, you note that there's a lot of innovation, there's a, a big desire to actually contribute to this huge narrative. And our first Space object was launched in the 1990s, 1998 to be specific. And since then, there's been such a wide proliferation of not only government programs, but especially private sector innovation. And currently, we have at least 318 companies which are specializing in space products and services for the African continent. And we see that governments are also banding together to support private sector innovation through the establishment of different institutions. We have the African Space Agency, which just began its operations this year at the headquarters in Cairo, Egypt, which essentially wants to bring together United Voice for Africa, recognizing that there's this global momentum that requires Africa to have a stronger voice in global affairs. So uh, just to reiterate again that we are sincerely at the commercial space age, not only for the globe, or rather not only for the Western or developed world, but I think for the entire globe, including emerging countries. That's absolutely true, Ruvimbo. I just, I wanna add to that, just so everyone listening knows, you know, a lot of people think about commercial space as rocket launches. Commercial space goes so far beyond rocket launches. And there are so many countries around the world participating in commercial space in numerous ways talking about satellite design or new sensor technology or just countless things that are revolutionizing what the earth looks like, how we're able to predict weather, how we grow crops, you know, reducing food insecurity, uh, increasing energy yields. And these are things that are happening all over the world by lots of different people from students in graduate programs to startups with five people, two big companies like SpaceX and Elon Musk. And you just can't even fathom the scale of the commercial space industry. Um, John Deere, for instance, they're getting into the space industry with their satellites, which talk to their tractors. Space is all around you. And it's not just launch companies. And it's it's wonderful. All right. So with all of these different aspects, uh, Obviously, there needs to be a legal component. So explain to the listeners, what is the concept of space law? And um, I want to qualify that by saying, being a former Mississippi legislator, I take great pride in the fact that uh, the first, I don't know if it's still the only, but the first space law degree program was at the University of Mississippi. And uh, I understand, Ms. Reichel, you, you're an alum of, of, of Ole Miss Law School. So, uh, yeah. yeah, so kind of kind of talk about what is the concept of space law and maybe a little history, how Ole Miss even got to be the school to have that program. Sure. Happy to do that, Eric. So yeah, I graduated from Ole Miss. Uh, Ole Miss does have both a JD certificate program in air and space and remote sensing law. And they also have an LLM program, which if you're not a lawyer, it's like a, a master's of law. Um, Eileen Galloway, I believe was the catalyst for why Ole Miss has that program. Uh, she's one of the first leading ladies in space law, really. She was born in 1906, if that tells you uh, how leading she was to this industry. There wasn't even a space program at that time. 
but she worked with the UN. She had uh, extensive scholarly writings about space law and uh, international law, and her papers are all at the University of Mississippi. And she donated them and her collection there. And I do believe that's why the program was started there. Uh, jo Joanne Gabrenowitz was over the program when I was there. It's now Michelle Hanlon. Uh, the program kind of, uh, let me talk about this a little bit differently. So there are kind of buckets of space law. And a lot of people when they hear space law, they think about international law and the Outer Space Treaty. And then there's another bucket that focuses on domestic regulations. And that's really the way that treaties kind of get applied into our legal system at the ground level. So the easiest example for me to give is we have um, international agreements that talk about weapons proliferation, right? And how we don't want the wrong people to get uh, chemical weapons or nuclear weapons. And in the way that that's enforced within the countries that implement these obligations is usually export control laws. They screen things that are being sent out of the country to make sure they're not going to nefarious actors. So sometimes uh, when people say space law, they mean international treaties. And sometimes they mean domestic regulations, which are applying concepts of the treaties. So I predominantly work in the domestic regulations within the United States. So talking about FAA, FCC, NOAA, things that regulate launch, remote sensing, satellite, uh, talking to them and what spectrum allocation. And Ole Miss actually has a program that's kind of focused on that domestic regulation bucket, though they cover the international treaties too. So I'll leave it there. Uh, Ruvimbo, I know you have a, a different perspective on uh, the concept of space law. Certainly, my work focuses more on the policy aspects, um, especially describing the international legal frameworks and how they interplay amongst one another. I think just uh, for purposes of the audience, it will be good to mention what's known in the Latin terminology as the corpus juris spatialis, which is the grand body of space law, which consists of mainly five international treaties and a further five international principles. And the difference, of course, between treaties and the principles are the treaties are binding and enforceable between the parties and the principles are voluntary obligations that stakeholders take up in the interests of creating um, some kind of standards. And the five treaties are the Outer Space Treaty, which is colloquially known as the Magna Carta of space, sort of the constitution of outer space and all the other principles and treaties sort of flow out from it. It provides a, a broad framework on how space activity should be conducted on a wide variety of themes, um, including, and most importantly, I think the themes of international cooperation, environmental protection, et cetera. And of course, the coordination of national space activities as Bailey is involved in. We also have uh, the Moon Agreement, which is self-explanatory. It's a dedicated document for the Moon specifically, and it has really interesting provisions. For example, it calls upon the international community to create some form of international regime for the sharing of space resources, which is a contentious topic, a developing topic at the moment. Um, and we have the Liability Convention, which helps us decide how we ascribe uh, fault for damages in outer space, and you'll be very interested to know that this treaty has not actually been invoked for use. So, you know, dispute resolution is a very interesting topic to focus on in the coming years as we sort of navigate how stakeholders can operate without causing undue interference and harm to one another. Um, and we also have the rescue agreement, which takes into consideration that astronauts are envoys of humankind and they need to be taken care of and, and rescued in times of peril. And lastly, the registration convention. Um, this just goes back to ensuring there's transparency in outer space. Um, you wouldn't drive your car without a license or without registering it according to the due regulations. So likewise in space, you have to make sure that your space object has all of its authorizations. Um, and these are sort of all the five treaties, the main ones that um, make up outer space activity and to a lesser extent, and as already mentioned, there are some others that relate to nuclear arms control, to broadcasting, to remote sensing, um, but no pun intended or pun intended rather, space uh, does not operate in a vacuum and most certainly not a legal vacuum. <laughs> that was pretty slick. 
Um, what what is well, and, and just to kind of put things in perspective, I'm 58 years old, so I'm older than the Outer Space Treaty. Just so y'all understand, that, that treaty was 1967, I believe, or some somewhere around there. Um, what is the Artemis Accords, and why is that important? Either one of you can do it. I'll let you lead on this. Certainly, uh, we're privileged to have a debate on this at the recent International Astronautical Congress. I'll try my hardest not to be too biased on the topic. Um, but the Artemis Accords are a set of non-legally binding instruments which have gained relevance following, of course, the rapid and successful contributions of emergent state and non-state actors in space. And essentially what the Artemis Accords are trying to achieve is a set of norms which recognize that the industry is perhaps developing a lot quicker than the multilateral process can manage. So it might be useful to have states come up with a series of voluntary obligations that can over time develop um, the status of binding and enforceable laws. And there have been a lot of uh, developments with the Artemis Accords. As far as I understand, I think there are 33 countries that have signed. The most recent country is Angola. And we have sort of a steady progression of um, spacefaring and what are so-called space aspiring countries as well, which are countries that want to develop their competencies through international cooperation, which is what the Artemis Accords promises. Um, so to that extent, we see some form of geopolitical, there are some geopolitical developments with the Artemis Accords. Of course, the existing tensions on Earth might have the capacity to filter into space as well. And um, it's a matter of diplomatic policy to ensure that, you know, these geopolitical tensions on Earth do not manifest in an area or in a realm that's intended to be for all humankind. So I suppose that's where much of the naysaying against the Artemis Accords arises from, you know, uh, topics such as the US, it's very US centric or that it doesn't encompass the actual thoughts of all humankind, et cetera. Um, but these are up for discussion, I suppose. I think the idea of the Artemis Accords is to keep them as sufficiently broad as possible in the beginning stages so that it can be a truly collaborative and adaptive governance mechanism as more countries come on and feed into that diplomatic process. So I'll hand it now to you. Really. So Eric, you invited us here theorizing that we're smarter than you. I invited Ruvimbo because I know she's smarter than me. Okay. So that was uh, <laughs> that was my plan. And I think she demonstrates that and how she summarizes the international perspective. Um, so just giving a little bit of character here, I think there is some misconception about the Artemis Accords that they're like a binding treaty. They're not, they're non-binding. Uh, it's led by the United States and it's an attempt to get, I think everyone on the same page and add some interpretation uh, by the different nation states, specifically by the United States, on how they're reading certain other provisions of other treaties, like the Outer Space Treaty. So one, just to give you an example, one provision would be uh, resource mining, where the Outer Space Treaty says that um, nation states won't claim basically property in outer space. But there's this hanging question of if we go and mine an asteroid, can we claim ownership of those resources? And in the Artemis Accords, the United States states a position that, yes, we believe that you can claim ownership of the resources you extract without violating the Outer Space Treaty. So that, that's one example. But of course, if you want to read any of these, you can just go to the State Department's website and you can um, you can pull them up. You can go to the UN website. And these are not long, hard to read documents. So you can really impress your friends and just go read the Outer Space Treaty and the Artemis Accords, bring it up at bar trivia, bring it up at Christmas dinner. You're basically <laughs> uh, you're informed on international space law. You can go read these. They're not hard. I just want you to know they are accessible and they're not written in crazy legalese. So I don't want your listeners to think that this is completely out of your reach or that this is only the realm of space lawyers. You as part of the public, as part of this commercial space industry, which you're in, whether you want to be or not, right? Even if you're a farmer using the John Deere tractors, you're using space technology. 
um, go and be informed on these things. And you can participate in these conversations too. Yeah. So y'all kind of make it seem like the Artemis Accords is more like a gentleman's agreement um, for lack of a better term. And it's, it's not binding, but I sense from Ravimbo's uh, <laughs> initial comment that there is a little heartburn in the international community about how, how those are kind of shaken out. Certainly, um, just to touch on some of the criticisms leveled against it, I would say that um, firstly, in the nature of the document itself, as you said, it's considered a soft law and not a hard law. So again, it doesn't actually solve the main challenge in international law, which is enforceability. That is, is there any real consequence for a failure to comply with you know, international obligations? So there is that challenge there. Um, then we also have some very contentious provisions in the Artemis Accords themselves, as Bailey already alluded to. There are provisions on um, the commercialization of space resources, which if we look at the international treaty frameworks are not all too clear on whether we are permitted to you know, sell, use, donate space resources. But the Artemis Accords makes it very clear and domestic US legislation makes it clear that there can be a commercialization or transfer of resources from outer space to Earth. We also have the contentious issue of what's known as safety zones in outer space, that is the ability to sort of preserve the scientific, um, scientific sites where stakeholders conduct their activities or experiments. And it's unclear what are the parameters of ensuring that safety zone or does it count as exclusion if we are to designate a certain area safety zone? How long can a stakeholder sort of claim sovereignty or claim occupation of that safety zone? These are all considerations to take in mind. So there's that uh, dual aspect of wanting to preserve the freedom to use and explore, but at the same time, how do we ensure that that in itself does not exclude another party? And again, as already mentioned, um, the fact that it might uh, look like the Artemis Accords are US centric, but an interesting fact about this, which I learned myself in my reading is, there were about eight initial countries which um, fed into the drafting of the Artemis Accords and each of them were afforded a veto power um, against any of the provisions if they disagreed with any of them. So to that extent, I think that argument is null and void. Um, it was an equal playing field. It was a very democratic process at the time. I think the real hallmark would be moving forward. Will there be iterative processes that allow for the progressive realization of collective interests or collective provisions that mean a lot to other stakeholders? So now that we have, I think it's uh, three countries now from Africa, signatories of the Artemis Accords, will there be another phase where perhaps their interests, such as capability building, could be fed into the drafting um, and amendments of this provision. So uh, definitely watch this space and see if the, you know, initial countries can live up to the promises as agreed. Ravimbo, you kind of like a, a little comedian on the side. You be throwing in these little puns and all this stuff. Watch this space. I heard you. So how many, <laughs> how many African nations are engaged in a space program and what is their level of engagement? So currently we have about 20 space programs in Africa. Um, just to give a little bit of history before I go into that, I would start by saying that our first space object was actually launched in 1998, if I'm not mistaken. And following from there, we've had a series of different developments, isolated developments through international partnerships, which have helped to bolster the industry. Uh, most interestingly, I would think, is the spaceport that was built by Italy in the 1960s and from which 27 launches were actually made. That happens to be, I think, um, one of the largest infrastructural uh, investments for space in Africa. And to date, we have 15 African countries that have actually contributed 58 satellite projects. Um, and as already mentioned, about 318 companies which specialize in space products and services for the African and global market. Um, I will say that perhaps our largest market segment at the moment is Earth observation, 
owing to the fact that um, Africa is really tapping into space as a form of meeting its sustainable development goals. So you'll find that a lot of um, the space applications and services are really digital and data-based in order to meet that digital or data gap in Africa. And then we're also followed, uh, also followed by connectivity needs as well. And to a lesser extent, I would say the upstream, which is um, perhaps what everyone else has in their mind, which is you know uh, launching rockets, going to the moon, creating components, having space ports, et cetera. These are developing, of course, but uh, again, just to reiterate that space for the SDGs is perhaps the main, um, the main focal point for Africa's space development. But we do see a number of African countries that have programs that are doing quite um, immense work through international cooperation, especially Egypt just recently signed an agreement with China for a manufacturing assembly and testing facility. Um, I think this is a very important development because it brings local capacity um, to the continent. That is the ability to not only develop a satellite, but perhaps launch it from the region. Um, and this is a competency that other countries have or have developed over time, such as Ethiopia, South Africa is another notable one, and Senegal as well. One interesting fact um, and interesting development that Africa is a hallmark for is in astronomy, the largest radio telescope array in the world is being uh, built conjointly in Africa and Australia, and about 80% of it will be in Africa. Um, South Africa has actually contributed 64 of these telescopes. Um, and this is remarkable, again, uh, just demonstrating the capacity that Africa has to contribute to global discourse. Um, but without, you know, singing too many praises, it hasn't, of, of course, been without its challenges. But I think with, with mutually reciprocal agreements, such as some of these that I've mentioned, I think Africa is certainly a force to be reckoned with as an emerging region. Um, and we can talk about as well the, the impact of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement that I think will be another game changer for the industry. Bailey, did you want to jump in on anything or are we good? I'm not sure I could add anything to that that wonderful explanation. Uh, Ravimbo pretty much covered it. Okay. So, Ravimbo, you said something about it was 300. I had 270 companies that were offering and developing space technologies and services in Africa. You say it's around 318? Yes, uh, we wouldn't. Uh, you wouldn't be wrong. I think uh, 276 were the numbers from 2022, and uh, in 2023 are the updated figures, 318, I believe. So how many? Because I've got like 19,000 people that are hired, uh, that are working in the industry in the in on the continent of Africa. Is it so? It's more than 19,000, right? Say like maybe 20, 25,000, maybe. Um, the last figures I saw uh, had a number around 90,000 as of 2023. So it's quite a sizable population now. Okay, 90,000. 90,000 okay. indeed. All right. Well, maybe they got their numbers mixed. They jumbled the number around. Anyway, the U.S. space industry employs double that uh, alone at 183,000 people. What has to happen for African companies to expand and what does the future look like for African Americans in the U.S. space industry? Vimbo, you want to take the first half of that? And I can talk about the domestic regulations. Certainly. I'll draw on a bit of my own research here and advance a bit of thought leadership. Um, I'd like to first start by defining what Africa's perceived goal is with international partnerships, and that is moving away from capacity building to capability building. And I'll try my hardest to explain this. Um, capacity building, I think, would be the capacity to build or implement a project, whereas capability would be the same capacity to build and implement, but of one's own accord if that makes sense. So being able to demonstrate a capacity without the support of the third party. 
Um, and that's what Africa, I believe, would like to move towards. So basically building um, indigenous capacity or local capacity, as we call it. And in order to do so, there are a number of governance uh, measures that will have to be taken. I think the first one, and as we've already touched on, advocacy, uh, advocating for the use of soft law as interim measures. So using documents such as the Artemis Accords or other development uh, protocols like China's Belt and Road Initiative, which has really taken off on the continent. Um, and using that to not only usher in development, but to bring in a sort of um, legal, a soft law legal system that can deal with interim measures much quicker as they arise. And uh, following from that, if we can also have more adoption of international treaty laws into domestic legislation, um, the international treaties provide a wonderful framework for how governments are supposed to domesticate certain provisions into the national laws. Um, and you'll find that that has not really fully been affected in Africa, so that hinders on the certainty and it also hinders on international competitiveness um, for lack of doing so. And then lastly, which I think is well underway, is creating a regional governance structure, and that is through the African Space Agency, uh, which we hope to see full implementation of. But I think um, one point that I'd like to add is also mutual reciprocity in international cooperation. I think the US, especially um, not being a very strong partner for Africa in the past, needs to sort of recognize the reasons why Africa is going into space and find ways of using space to meet those needs, um, find ways to also address various uh, trade and investment related obstacles, such as the, um, the very difficult export control processes that might hinder doing business in Africa. Um, and likewise, of course, Africa would have to manage its end of the deal, which is um, removing those obstacles that uh, undermine certainty of doing business in Africa, whether it's political, social, or economic. Yeah, so just adding on to that, thanks, Ruvimbo. Um, I think the first time you and I ever talked, uh, you had contacted me um, to talk about export controls. And in that conversation, I seem to remember like two takeaways. And this was years ago, so it could have changed between then and now. But uh, we talked about how the African various countries within Africa would need to become party to the MTCR, the Missile Technology Control Regime. And to do that, you have to have a, a comprehensive export control program um, so that the other countries that are party to that, I say party, um, it's, it's not a treaty, but that our members could uh, export back and forth with Africa on highly controlled technology. Uh, the other part, I believe I recall, was talking about just uh, business practices and having solid established contract law so that when people come and they bring their business to Africa, they can rely on the infrastructure of like a court system when they have uh, commercial disputes and acceptance of international arbitration uh, rules and things like that. Is that still kind of where you think that there needs to be more infrastructure? I certainly think so, especially um, not only in terms of the court system in general, but alternative dispute resolution as well. Looking at um, just how the international treaty frameworks are also feeding into dispute resolution mechanisms for space, we see that the way in which the New York Convention for Arbitration and the Singapore Convention for Mediation, I believe, how they are ratified or how states have signed onto that is also feeding into how these uh, dispute resolution mechanisms can be relied on for space as well. And we see there's not a wide adoption of these treaty frameworks in Africa, which again has limited the application of ADR for space commercial disputes. So again, if there's not a mechanism for ensuring that contracts are upheld, then it's less likely that stakeholders and international stakeholders will want to take part in commercial business transactions in Africa. Yeah, okay, so it sounds like still the same perspective. So from the US perspective, uh, my firm has several companies that are really interested in taking their business to Africa 
And one of the big issues remains to be export controls from the U.S. side. So from the U.S. side, we have uh, the State Department controlling the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, which has the United States munitions list. And that's where a lot of uh, higher end technology, military uh, related technology tends to go. And then we have the Commerce Department controlling basically everything else. So there's space stuff on both of those lists, but if they're on the ITAR, they're more highly controlled and very difficult to export, especially if they're considered missile technology. You have to have an international treaty in place in some instances to be able to uh, export things out of the country. And there are only four of these types of treaties, I think it's four right now in place, called Technology Safeguard Agreements, um, where you can export missile technology. And rockets would be considered missile technology because uh, you know, they could just be pointed in a different direction and they do become missiles. So that's still one of the things, export control reform, that has to happen or treaties have to be put in place, which is no small lift in order to do more business with Africa from the United States. And I can't speak on behalf of like the European nations. Uh, some of their export restrictions are not quite as severe as the United States. It may be a little bit easier to increase commerce between those nation states. But from the U.S. side, export control reform would have to happen. And for that to happen with the African countries, the U.S. would have to feel confident that there is significant enough uh, enforcement capability within the country that you're exporting to to control the technology and keep it from getting to the hands of bad actors. So, Bailey, uh, just to follow up on the second part of the question, what does the future look like for African-Americans to get into the industry? Because it sounds like it's a pretty heavy lift for anybody, but, you know, if, especially with the potential to develop business relationships with uh, the continent of Africa, what would it take for black folks to say, I want to set up a business? Have you seen a lot of businesses come up in your, is in your consulting and, and legal role? Uh, what does it look? What does the future look like for a U.S. person to establish a space business in Africa? Is that the question? Well, it just a space business anywhere. Uh, but since the question was geared toward African Americans, are you seeing a lot of Black folks getting into this business? And what is what is the opportunity for them to get in? So in the United States and in most of Europe, it's it's only a heavy lift if you want to be the founder of a capital intensive company. So not every type of space business is capital intensive. For instance, if, if you want to be a lawyer, you're a services provider and you can be in space law and the lift to hang your own shingle or go and work in that field is not terribly different than uh, other paths for lawyers. There are a couple of programs, as you know, like Ole Miss, you can go to and you can specialize. Um, as far as if you want to build like a rocket launch company or any type of traditional hardware manufacturer, you want to build satellite buses, anything like that. Those are capital intensive. So you have to raise that capital on the front end. And traditionally, space companies in the U.S. have relied on investments from venture funding and the venture funding in the last year or so. While it was crazy two years ago, it felt like venture firms were just throwing money at space companies just to have a space company in their portfolio, just for the bragging rights. That has dried up pretty substantially. And the due diligence is becoming much um, deeper on behalf of venture investors. So I would say it's harder now, right now in 2023 and 2024 to start a space company than it was even a couple of years ago because the money for the capital up front is harder to get. But the barrier is getting lower in some ways in that getting the education that's specific to space is becoming more abundant. Um, I have to give this brag to Association of Commercial Space Professionals. They're a pretty new nonprofit, but they actually offer training and regulatory compliance to lawyers and to people who are not in engineering roles. And that hasn't really existed up until this last year. And that provides a path to go into working for say a space startup 
and understanding the different hats you need to wear to get a company's mission from initial concept to orbit to mission one launch. You have to deal with all these different regs and they're providing a lot of training that can help lawyers kind of specialize into the space industry from other industries. Um, that is getting easier because of the abundance of information available and training and education. All right. So we're kind of up against it, but um, there was a couple of questions I want to get in. I probably won't be able to do it or I'll try to be creative because Revimbo kind of answered a little bit about the one of the questions in dealing with outside of funding, what role should government play concerning space exploration? She talked about in legislation, putting more of the language of treaties in there. Um, what's going to be the biggest legal challenge as far as space in the future? Hmm. So I think there's two sides to the answer to that question. Um, and for me, it's definitely the regulatory side and getting companies through the hurdles to even get to space so that we can make space uh, a lower cost to access. And we use the phrase a lot, democratize access to space, where we give everyone the ability to get to space and not just certain countries or certain ultra wealthy companies. I, I think that's the biggest barrier and there's just so many things that have to happen to truly make that, to make that a, a realistic concept. Uh, Ruvimbo, you were about to speak. I'm interested in what you're gonna say. Wow, it's a, it's a tough one. There's so many issues that can merge into, I think the broad theme of governance challenges. Um, but maybe looking at the African perspective, I think that the largest hurdle might be the coordination of this new uh, multilateral system that will be created through the African Space Agency. Because essentially we're bringing together 54 different voices under one institution. Um, and just for general knowledge purposes, the African Space Agency will be housed under the broader African Union structure, which to its credit has had a lot of success in terms of implementing different programs um, pertaining to peace and security and human rights and science and technology. So of course it would be a viable umbrella for this new institution, but in the converse as well, um, it's unfortunately not had a good track record in terms of implementing decisions amongst the member states. And I think uh, member state conflicts um, are not new. I think we've seen them in other multilateral systems like the WHO, et cetera, and, and even the UN um, and UNOSA. We've seen that it can be a slow and deliberative process. Um, and estimates also suggest that about um, only 15% of decisions made overall by the African Union have actually been implemented. So, and this is since 2001. So we see that there might be a bit of challenge in creating that consensus that is so necessary, not only for uh, development in space, but also international law in general. So I think um, just managing member state contributions, managing um, outcomes and expectations in a multilateral system uh, will be Africa's biggest challenge and maybe even the global challenge as well as we tackle more deeper issues like space sustainability and uh, deep space exploration. All right. You know, I think Go we ahead, could Bailey. really summarize the answer to I think we could summarize the answer to this question as our biggest barrier is getting the people of Earth to all agree and move in the same direction. And we don't have time to go into what exactly all that means, but in general, uh, we're our own worst enemies when it comes to space. Uh, that's mm -hmm. usually, that, that in politics that's usually the case. It's the humans that 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 cause the problem. Uh, Ladies, I thank y'all for coming on. Uh, uh, I, I I think that you did the subject a uh, great service in it, in it, in bringing it to the audience and talking in detail about what it actually entails. Uh, and I think people are going to be enlightened to the fact that how global this is, and it's not just the United States and Russia and a couple other countries that 
this is really becoming something that is international. And in particular with my audience, the, the impact that the African continent is playing. So if people want to get more information from each one of you, how can they reach out to you? Sure. Uh, so for me, you can go to my law firm's website. It's Aegis, A-E-G-I-S dot law. And you can find me there. And for me, I'm readily available on LinkedIn. My LinkedIn name is Rubimbo Samanga. And I also have a website, uh, www.rubimbosamanga.com. Um, and I'm fairly responsive. All right. Well, ladies, again, Rubimbo and, and Bailey, thank you all so much for coming on. Uh, I've learned a lot in, in this brief time. And uh, I'm sure if something pops off, uh, as far as space goes and stuff, I'll be reaching out to y'all to get y'all's input and get y'all back on the podcast. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Eric. We'd be more than happy to. Thank you so much. Thank y'all. All All right, guys, and we're going to catch y'all on the other side. All right, and we are back. So now it's time for our next guest. Our next guest is Elizabeth Silic LaRue. As a CEO of Silic Consulting Services, Elizabeth helps clients to craft policies, programs, and projects aimed at equitable access to nature, the responsible development of renewable energy, energy justice, climate justice, ocean justice, nature conservation, and equitable access to green economic opportunities for those who have traditionally been locked out of conservation and sustainability spaces. She serves clients across the national and international nonprofit, government, and private sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my distinct honor and privilege to have as a guest on this podcast, Elizabeth Silic LaRue. All right, Elizabeth Silic LaRue. I'm sorry, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. Uh, I'm glad you were able to uh, join us. I know you've been dealing with a little little struggle here and there, but uh, but I'm glad you've been able to push through and we can get this going. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yes, ma'am. All right, so normally what I try to do um with guests is if I can find a quote that's either related to the work they do, something they may have written in a book or something they may have said, uh, I try to put it out there and, and get your take on it. So your quote is the inextricable connection between social oppression and environmental degradation means a solution for either must tackle both. In fact, the intersections between racism, sexism, classism, extractive natural resource use, pollution, health, and climate change are firmly entrenched, and artificial compartmentalization creates gaps and delays that we cannot afford. An environmental movement that does not proactively correct an equitable distribution of its costs and benefits is failing to fully live up to its promise. Kind of talk to me about that quote. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Now that you read it out loud, I'm like, oh, there's so much to unpack. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I can can talk about that. I guess the first thing I'll talk about is what led me to make a statement like that and what led me to see uh, my work in environmental conservation and justice that way. and so I think I think my view on that is a product of having studied in undergrad um, systemic oppression through a women's studies major, 
um, that led me to learn a lot about the history of colonialism and the way that systemic oppression works um, throughout, throughout the globe, but more specifically in the United States and the way that the rise of capitalism, which of course undergirds US culture and economics and everything, governance, right? Um, played a role, or in some cases, I guess you could say more than played a role, like fundamentally undergirded, for example, enslaved, enslaved you know, the, the, the instances of enslavement of Black Americans in the United States. I, 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 I hesitate to say slavery because slavery existed way before that in different forms, but in the specific commodification of human beings, right, as, as it took place in, throughout the Americas um, and, and most famously and um, insidiously in the United States, that that, that is all bound up in the way that we, and I say we meaning humans <laughs> at this point, um, view natural resources and use natural resources and extract natural resources and discard natural resources. The, the, the fundamental ideology there is very much the same. And so contemporaneously with that, with that fact, right, we also have the, the consequence which is the perpetuation of inequity that is done through the manipulation of environmental natural resources. So I, I, that's a very general statement and I'll give an example to illustrate. So, um, and, and most, I think a lot of people have come, you know, have heard this before, but um, for example, on a global scale, the countries which emit the most uh, greenhouse gas you know, pollutants responsible for climate disruption are not the countries that are feeling the actual consequences um, at the same level that they're emitting. So it's the, the impact is disproportionate. The impact of climate disasters disproportionately impact people living in nations that aren't responsible for actually generating those greenhouse gases, right? So you see the inequity play out in the consequences of that extractive, um, exploitative system. And in the United States, that looks like, well, one perfect example I, I can think of is that when you look at maps of the United States where redlining occurred, right? Where redlining delineated who could live where and specifically pushed black and I would say immigrants from Latin America as well, to some degree, into particular areas. Those are literally there's a there's a direct overlap. Those are the areas that suffer disproportionate burdens of pollution. So, power plants will be located there. Chemical um, industrial plants will be located there. Um, investments will be withdrawn from there. Right, in, investments in infrastructure that would actually um, create a better quality of life for people living there. Are, are actually proactively taken away. And so I don't think that you can talk about environmental conservation or climate action um, without acknowledging that because it's it's just interwoven. So that's, that's where that comes from. So <clears throat> what would justice look like or what does justice look like in an environmental sense? Mm, yeah, that is a big question <laughs> with a big answer. And I think, you know, just like just like any other situation, there there are different answers depending on what where you are, right? Like lo localized action is what actually makes a difference for people in most cases, especially with environmental issues, right? Because you're in your environment. <laughs> um, it, what's happening around where you physically are is going to be most pertinent to you. Um, so I think, it, it really varies, but there are some sort of core principles. And the one that I would say is probably most important and probably most relevant for you, um, you know, working in the arena of politics is the, the idea of procedural justice, which really is about people being in charge of the decisions that are made about their environment. 
right? Because that's not how it is right now. Um, that's not, you know, oftentimes, even, even in the United States, which arguably still, um, <laughs> arguably still has some democratic processes in place, right? Um, the, the, the participation of people in areas that, that we refer to as environmental justice communities, which I think is a terrible way to refer because the, the whole point is that there isn't justice there, but um, I'll say communities facing environmental racism, uh, you know, oftentimes, although there may be a, a, a procedure in place or um, stakeholder engagement, you know, sort of uh, criteria and, and processes, they are wholly inadequate. They're very rarely effective. And, you know, I, like one woman that I interviewed recently who, who lives in Newark, New Jersey and works on environmental justice, she said, okay, well, it's great. You know, now we have um, access to these decision makers. We're able to go in and speak to whoever we want, but we don't see where our input is actually making it into the plan. Um, it, they listen to us, but did they hear us? You know, they, they listen to us, but did they, um, did they follow our, our advice? No. So, you know, true procedural justice, I think, like anything, boils down to power. And people having power over the decisions that are made related to their immediate environment is probably the first, and I would say maybe the fundamental um, aspect of advancing justice in that, in that arena. All right, so... And I and I get that it's uh, it's really kind of a, a broad question because um, one of the things that the first time I ever heard the term was uh, when we were dealing with communities that were being built near these giant uh, power line transformers, right? And there was a yep. concern about uh, you know was the amount of radiation coming from those power lines uh, that was affecting people's health. And, mm -hmm. you know, so, I mean, you know, that was an issue specifically for that community uh, to address. Uh, that's totally different than say here in Atlanta, because that was the situation in Mississippi here in Atlanta. The big controversy is, the building of a movie studio and a police training center in this giant, mm. giant forest that has, right. you know, been part of the, the, the balance in Atlanta, as far as keeping the air clean. Uh, and, yeah. and you know, you've got those two, th really three issues as far as the movie industry that's growing, the need for better police training and the environment. And, and the community is kind of like, eh, what do we do? <laughs> you know, we, we don't really like the protesters, but at the same time, we understand why we kind of agree with their position, you know? So, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. So I understand how the issue of environmental justice can basically be tailor-made to the a specific community that it impacts. Yeah. Yeah, and in both of those instances, right, the the actual impact may be very different, but in both cases, if you if you have procedural justice in place and you have um, the people who are going to be most affected by those decisions participating in the decisions <laughs> and you know drawing boundaries, right, saying like. You know, because people, you know, most people, I think a lot of people are reasonable, right? And and they might say, okay, yeah, we we do see that there's a financial benefit to this um to this industry of film and you know entertainment or whatever. Um, but can we do this away rather than doing this the cheapest way for those who are going to profit off of this? <laughs> can we do this in a way that is more sensitive to environmental factors, health factors, whatever, whatever the, the impacts might be. And um, who are the, the, another piece of this is who are the benefits going to accrue to, right? Because that's, a, that's the like sort of a side of environmental justice that I don't think is talked about enough. Um, it's not just about distribution of harm, it's about distribution of benefits. So if, if you're gonna come in and do something 
um, that is environmentally damaging, but economically beneficial, let's say, which, you know, I don't think that that's necessarily a sacrifice we should always be making, but let's say for the sake of argument, that's what you're going to do. Well, how is that truly benefiting the local population? And don't tell me about, you know, low level, unstable jobs. No, that's not, <laughs> you know, that's not justice. That's that's actually serving the same people who, you know, own shares in the, in the company <laughs> behind the development, right? Exactly. Um, so with, how are the benefits actually being equitably distributed and equitable being the key, the key term there? Um, because honestly, if, if we were to look at projects like that, if, if, um, if those who, you know, are making serious money off of projects were, were forced to look at, uh, their projects in that way, and let's say they, you know, take away all the government subsidies that, um, support irresponsible development and, um, enforce some, some requirements to hire locally, um, you know, pertaining to the good, the real good jobs that come out of it. And um, they were required to comply with uh, other sorts of mechanisms that would help to spread the wealth, right, more equitably. They might say, you know what, this project isn't really that profitable. Let's not do it. Right. <laughs> so you might actually reduce environmental harm that way. Right. So that kind of leads into the next question in a sense. Um, at the recent COP28 summit, nearly 200 nations agreed to transition away from fossil fuels. What else should be done by governments to slow down the negative impacts of climate change? And you kind of talked about in that last answer about some, you know, putting in stipulations about quality of jobs and those kind of things. What else, what else do you mm -hmm. think the government should do? The government should do in order to reduce emissions and comply with basically get our, our carbon footprint down. Is that, is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's like, you know, one, and you touched on it earlier when you were talking about the quote that uh, a lot of the countries that are putting out the emissions are not feeling the impacts as compared to the other countries that, you know, they're just, they, they're not even close to the output, mm -hmm. but they're getting more of the climate effects. And so that's what yeah. some people were saying. It was like, okay, well, I think Greta Thornburg even said that all this did was just make the companies, the countries that were the biggest villains, you know, feel better about their guilt. <laughs> it didn't really it doesn't it, it yeah. doesn't really move the needle that everybody's made this commitment what what does that commitment really look like yeah mm, mm, mm. yeah yeah and it's gonna i mean it's it is gonna be different for different countries based on everything right <laughs> based on all like gdp industry um capabilities all of that it's gonna look different i mean i guess maybe we can talk about uh, the U.S. because, I, you know, I can't really opine on what countries that are feeling the brunt um, without actually being responsible <laughs> for the, the output. Um, I mean, if I were in, in a country like that, my, my focus would be um, on resiliency and on trying to actually get polluters to pay. Um, but in the U.S., I mean, I think, number one, <laughs> we have to stop incentivizing pollution, right? Like we have to stop giving subsidies to oil companies on one hand, even while we talk about transitioning to renewables. Like it's just not, uh, it's it's what what in, in legal terms we would call a perverse incentive. It's, um, it, it's in complete contradiction to where we need to go. Um, so that's number one, I, I think, the issue of industry capture of governance um, came up a lot around COP28, right? Like there was a lot of commentary, rightly so, about the fact that you have oil rich, oil dependent nations leading the conversation on exactly. the climate summit. Like, yeah, Vice President Gore just, highlighted that. Right. But here's the thing, like that's not unusual in the environmental field. And I think that that's something that a lot of people don't know. And I didn't realize until I you know, graduated from from law school and started to work in the environmental sector 
how entrenched, even in the United States as well, how entrenched um, industry is in the decision-making around governing industry. <laughs> you know, I mean, you literally have this, this fox in the hen house situation. Um, and, and I think that at a, at a fundamental level boils down to like conflicts of interest, right? In, in, in governance are always going to produce these inequitable, destructive, short-term gain types of, uh, of consequences. So, you know, at a really fundamental level, I think if we want to proceed with actually leading in a transition to, a, you know, a cleaner, more just economy and, and power systems, and I mean, by power, I mean energy, like, you know, powering energy, whatever, uh, power plants and, and all of that, um, that they, they need to be... Um, we, we need to be putting people in power through elective governance that truly are not tied to industry. And that's very hard, as you know, because of the, um, the link between funding and successful election. Right. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but I don't see that trajectory <laughs> changing right now. And, and, you know, that doesn't mean it won't. But, you know, I think that that, that is really... A fundamental issue at the local level, of course, there's a lot more that can be done um, in terms of, you know, passing everything from zoning <laughs> to, um, to, you know, more state level legislation that either discourages or disincents uh, um, dirty fuel burning and and sources of of energy that um, are are combustible and and pollute and incentivizing cleaner energy. Um, the other thing that I don't think enough people are talking about and that I will put out there is that, and, and, and even in conversations with people about energy and fossil fuels and climate, I, I'm appalled at how little it comes up that like, we need to reduce our need and our dependency on electricity for everything. And that's not the way we're going, right? That's not the direction we're going in. We're going in the direction of yeah, just produce more solar panels. Yeah, just <laughs> more wind turbines. And, you know, with this this assumption that the only way forward in, in a modern society is to accept that our demand for electricity will just grow and grow and grow. Um, and it's it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, we, we use way more than we need. We, you know, electrifying everything is not necessarily the answer, particularly when you look at the fact that a lot of um, issues arise around the critical minerals, for example, that are, you know, dug up in places like Democratic uh, Republic of Congo. And, you know, there are horrible injustices associated with that. So, you know, I, I think we actually do need to kind of like think about backing away from, you know, excessive use of technology and just using less. Um, and that also is relevant when it comes to fossil fuels and climate, because a lot of the um, the pressure that is being put on oil companies to um, essentially not exist anymore, right? <laughs> to stop utilizing their products in order to uh, power the world, so to speak, they're pivoting to plastics production because plastic is made of oil. Right. Plastic is just a direct oil or oil is, yeah, I, I don't know if I said that right, but oil is used to make plastic. So, you know, using less and, and reframing our, our thinking about the way we operate in the world and, and using um, resources would actually help in that regard, too, um, as opposed to, oh, let's just keep on using and using and using, but we'll use differently. Backing away from, you know, so much consumption, I think, is something that we really need to, to do. So how have climate disasters been leveraged for political purposes and what can we do to stop that? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, what comes to mind is um, actually what comes to mind is something I read not long ago about how, I don't know if this answers your question, but about how um, in the, in the aftermath 
of hurricanes and other climate disasters in southern rural Florida and um, I guess other states in the South, how white supremacist um, terrorist groups actually move in and uh, provide aid to the people who are, you know, suffering from that um, that disaster which of course is going to foster immediate loyalty, right? Immediate, you know, affinity. Um, that's what comes to mind when, when you talk about, you know, leveraging political uh, opportunity out of, out of disasters. And I think the way that, you know, the way to curb situations like that is the government should be doing its job, right? And actually providing the relief that, um, that, you know, these kind of bad actors move in and take advantage of. I'm curious, do you have a specific um, example of like a politician using it, leveraging it for their gain? Well, that you were thinking of? Well, it, you know, my firsthand experience was the guy I ran against for the U.S. Senate, uh, Trent Lott. Um, you know, Trent was living on the coast at the time when Katrina hit. And then he ended up moving in my legislative district, ironically, of all the places he could have come. And so, uh, you know, that was an issue that was coming up in, in the election. You know, it's like, well, you know, he was one of us and he survived through. It's like y'all are in FEMA trailers. He got a brand new five bedroom house that he doesn't even <laughs> live in. How, how, did, how, does, right. how is he a champion for you know you know for your cause you know i mean that was i mean that was kind of the uh gist of you know how people use it and then when we went into a special session uh to deal with that the 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 main bill that we were dealing with was moving the casinos from changing the law so they wouldn't be on the water moving them 800 feet inland so, mm. you know, and they say, well, the priority is we got to get these jobs. I said, there are literally 17 women that are missing, that we have no idea where they are, let alone anything, because they were all Haitian women. And they had worked at the mm. casinos and the apartment complex was close to the to beach and that got wiped out. And to this day, mm. I don't think we know what happened to them. And so, you know, it was like, but the biggest priority for us is moving the casinos 800 feet inland. I said, that's insane. Mm. You know, that's not, that's not dealing Couching with that. the people. And so their argument was, well, we got to get the people back to work. You don't even know who's there to work. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, yeah. that's where I, I kind of, when I saw it, I kind of said, hmm, that's, that'll be interesting. Let me pick her brain on that one. See what she thinks. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, that's a, that that's a, that that's really helpful for me to understand kind of what you're what you're getting at. And so I think two things. Number one is jobs are always leveraged to subsume any other potentially more important issue, right? And that definitely shows up in the environmental sector a lot. Um, you know, the, the environment being sacrificed to jobs is like, <laughs> it's, it's just so common in, in the rhetoric um, that, you know, I, I barely even hear it anymore. Like, you know, it's going to, it's going to be said. Um, and in this context, you know, subsuming um, the, a, a human rights issue, right. Or like uh, basically what, what sounds like a human rights issue an immigration issue to jobs um you know, probably proved effective, especially in Mississippi. I think on a broader scale, the way that we are, the only way we'll be able to combat people leveraging um, climate disasters and, and other just consequences of environmental destruction in order to advance their economic gain, uh, which is what sounds like happened there, and their political power is <clears throat> people need to be able to discern and like see this that narrative for what it is right and that is a, that i mean i hate it's so it's so trite to say this but that's a matter of education um you know we need to learn how to think critically and to not take what we hear especially from politicians at face value because it very rarely is sadly <laughs> you know and and so 
voters and people who are um, you know, observing this political discourse need to have a foundation of knowledge about the way that propaganda is formed, about the way that you know, political um, entities and parties and individuals are, um, the way their positions are shaped, who's funding them, why, what their, their real economic agenda is. Like, these are not things that are taught certainly not in high school or, you know, in college programs, it really depends. Um, But like this, these conversations need to be um, part of mainstream. And unfortunately, they're really, really, it's, in my opinion, you tell me, um, but I think like social media has made it worse, you know, like people just latch on to sound bites and you know, follow who they follow the positions of those that they literally follow on social media without any critical thought. And I think that is that's a prerequisite to being able to challenge any of this political positioning. Um, If you just if you're not able to understand that people say things they don't mean in order to get what they want, (laughs) um, you know, and and you have to be able to see see through it, um, you know, we're not going to make progress in that area. Yeah, and just to highlight your point before we move on, uh, you know, a lot of these folks have detailed, you know, job opening descriptions about being a communications director for a member of Congress as opposed to being a legislative director. It was one, I think the communications director was like five paragraphs of description and the legislative director was literally one. Uh, Mm. And it's like, it should be the other way around. But anyway, uh, that, yeah. that, just, that just highlights your point about being more concerned about how you look on social media than you are about governing. Um, yep. So I want to get to two other things that are more personal, I guess, uh, with you before we get off, because we we're running up against it. One, your company's website uh, talks about offering a new service, conscientious Immigration counseling. What is conscientious immigration and why is that important? Yeah. Um, so, well, first I'll say the reason I started to, well, I will be launching those services in January is because my husband and I recently emigrated from the United States to Mexico. Um, and I think that when we were looking for support and, you know, kind of guidance. Um, there just really wasn't much. There was there were a lot of people out there with podcasts, you know, kind of <laughs> running their mouths about <laughs> how great it is to be a digital nomad. And like, you know, it was very frequently single people that didn't have a lot of ties, didn't have debt, didn't have like, you know, the things that a lot of us do have. And furthermore, there were there were sort of these and this will probably lead into your next question. <laughs> um, there were there were offerings specifically aimed at black populations, like, you know, ter- the term Blackxit, right? The exit of black people from the United States that were not going to welcome my husband and I because I'm a white woman and he's a black man and it wasn't for us, right? So, and that, that was made clear several times. Um, and so, you know, I basically thought to myself, all right, you know, there's this gap in in assistance and services that I am now in a position to fill because I did it all myself. Um, I mean, my husband helped with a lot, but in terms of, you know, the organizing and the planning, that was me and my legal training that helped me figure out how to navigate this. And so, but I didn't just want to say, okay, like I'll help if you want to leave the U.S. for whatever reason, whoever you are and whatever you believe, I'll help you. No, um, I really conscientious immigration for me is about really being mindful of the impact that you as a U.S. citizen um, have on your home nation. And particularly because we moved to Mexico, we were considering other places in Latin America. And, you know, there are these real, very distinct financial disparities between um, people from the U.S. and people from Latin America in terms of, you know, just economics. And there's this history, right, of, (laughs) and like, it's not a secret to anybody that Americans are, people from the United States are, um, have a reputation of being like really 
culturally unaware and obnoxious and extractive and kind of emulating this the spirit of colonialism and so I was like that's not who I want to work with <laughs> number one and it's and like I don't want to help those people come here because there are already enough of them um so you know because we've been very very mindful like we rent a house that was built a long long time ago from a, a man who you know his grandmother owned the house here he's Mexican he's from this part of Mexico and you know we're very like we we try to like contribute as much as possible we like clean up beaches and you know all of that um so when I decided to launch the services I was I was essentially what the conscientious immigration tagline is there to dissuade people that I don't want to work with from coming to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so people who do want to move, but want to like, you know, don't want to like become gentrifiers or, you know, be offensive um, in, in the way that they, they behave and um, who really want to come as sort of guests and, and be respectful of the culture and make a positive contribution. Um, those are my clients, right? Those are the people I want to work with. All right. And and like you said, that does lead into my next question. Uh, you have written about the impacts of miscegenation and racial identity. Why do you feel comfortable sharing your personal struggles and how do you hope it benefits others? Mm. Well, I don't know. I wouldn't say I feel comfortable. <laughs> um, actually, I'm 44 years old and I only started writing about this two years ago. Um I've been in an interracial family since I was 15. I had my daughter when I was 15 years old and her father was black. Um, and so, you know, I wouldn't say that I felt comfortable. It was, there was a long time that I wanted to talk about things and I didn't feel comfortable. And I felt like it would probably get me to lose my job. So um, now that I work for myself, I have more flexibility. Um, I think the reason that I do is because I can't imagine that I'm the only one out there, <laughs> you know, that feels this way or that, are, you know, we're the only couple out there that's going through, the, you know, experiencing this sort of othering and alienation that comes from being in an interracial marriage. Um, and, and I think that there's a narrative out there about interracial relationships and about, um, about like whether we actually, um, do face discrimination or, you know, <laughs> that I need, I felt like I needed to correct, you know, because there, like people will tell you and people have told me in the United States, like, oh, like that's not an issue anymore. You know, people don't care who you marry. And I'm like, I beg to differ. Like <laughs> we've been through, you know, we've faced a lot of hostility and disapproval and, you know, and then if you, you know, if you start Googling going on social media, you'll, you'll see a lot of people have opinions about it. Right. And, and that's white people and black people. Um, it doesn't tend to be anybody. It seems like nobody else really cares. Right. But it, <laughs> between, between white Americans and black Americans, there is definitely still a lot of um, hostility and, and disapproval. And I, ju I guess I just felt like, you know, it's something that hurts me. Um, it's something that it, literally, it drove us out of the country but fundamentally. I mean, that was our primary reason for leaving. Um, and I wanted to connect with people and not, ne not necessarily connect, that's not the right word. I wanted people who are in this position to read what I wrote and, and, be, and feel affirmed and feel like, you know, we're not crazy. This is happening. It's not right. And hopefully, um, hopefully for people who are kind of sit on the fence about it and don't necessarily, you know, think about it that much to show them a perspective so that they don't fall into the camp of being anti, um, anti interracial relationship, because it's not helping anybody to do that. It's not. I mean, you know, we have enough division and hatred. And, and honestly, I feel like being in an interracial family actually does open people's eyes to from both sides to where, where people are coming from. We don't have enough cross-cultural communication and, you know, really, really trying to empathize with each other, really trying to see each other as human beings. We don't have enough of that. And you see where it leads, right? Dehumanization and violence. So I just, you know, I felt like I, I've been living this, this, reality for 
30 something years or 30, almost 30 years. And um, I have something to say and I'm going to say it and I'm not comfortable. And I hate when people, when trolls come onto my work and start, you know, with the nonsense, it, it, it affects me deeply, um, which is why I'm quick with the black button now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, and it, I, we don't have time, but I, I did want to get into the digital detox, but that sounds like that's part of the process as far as yes. <laughs> blocking folks. Um, yes. So, so tell folks how they can get in touch with you uh, for your services. Uh, they want to talk sure. about these issues and so on. How, do, how can they reach you? Yeah. The, well, my website is www.siliconsultingservices.com. Um, and on LinkedIn, I am active on LinkedIn when I'm not in digital detox. <laughs> and uh, that is um, my, my name, Elizabeth Silic LaRue. And um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's pretty much how you can get in touch with me. I, I'm not going to, you know, give my phone number out on, on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's really the way is, and, and my emails on my website. And, you know, if particularly if somebody is interested in emigrating and wants to pursue that, I actually have a form on the website um, that, you know, people can fill out and I'll get back to them. And uh, LinkedIn, I'm, you know, I'm very accessible until I'm not, you know, like <laughs> anybody can reach out to me, but like if, if it comes with disrespect or, you know, any kind of like, whatever, you know what people do. Right. Um, I'm just not, I don't have room in my life for that. So. I got you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, Elizabeth, uh, sister, I, I greatly appreciate you making the time for me and making the time to be on the podcast. And uh, like I said, we, we'll get you back on to, get into more detail about this digital detox. That sounds like something a lot of us need to do. Um, yes. Yes. All right. All right, guys. Well, we're all gonna... right. Go ahead. Appreciate it. No, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for all the work you're doing because, you know, there's still hope. There's still hope for the United States, but it's important that, you know, voices like yours are out there encouraging people and guiding them on what to do. Well, so thank you. Thank you for that. All right, guys, we're going to catch y'all on the other side. All right, and we are back. And so now, my final guest. And her name is Marta Hardy. Marta Hardy, 27-year-old Haitian-American woman born in, on February 22, 1996, in St. Paul, Minnesota, stands as the first generation in her family with her parents, older brother, and sister originally hailing from Haiti. Despite facing hardships during her upbringing, Marta tenaciously graduated from high school for performing arts and has developed over eight years to serving her community. The ongoing turmoil in Haiti represents a continuous cycle of challenges that deeply affected Marta's family. Recently, her parents returned to the States from Haiti, profoundly disheartened by the distressing events unfolding in their homeland. Motivated by this and the persistent issues plaguing Haiti, Marta initiated her own organization in Atlanta, Georgia, where she can now be a service to her people and address the global and local issues taking place. In just five months of active engagement, Marta has assembled an exceptional team and forged a partnership with Children's Fate, an organization dedicated to housing and mentoring displaced youth, youth in the Cameroon. Her organization doesn't just uh, seek to as assist but aims to address and deliberate on the issues prevalent in Haiti, proposing a fresh approach for future nonprofits. Marta's vision extends beyond global outreach. She is passionately committed to instigating change at the local level. Her unwavering dedication and strategic partnerships reflect her resolute mission to make a tangible and transformative impact within her community and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor and privilege to have as a guest on this podcast, Ms. Marta Hardy.
All right. Marta Hardy, how you doing? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I am doing fine. I am glad that you were able to come on. And I understand we have a guest that you brought on the program. You want to introduce her? Yes, we have Tamir Chu. She is our grant writer at the Martha Spahn Foundation, but she is also a founder of her own organization called the Children's Faith in Cameroon. You want to say hi, Tamia? Oh, yes. Hello. <laughs> um, I'm very happy to be here and to, to be part of this podcast. And uh, I look forward to this enriching this enriching session. I am Tomia Cho from Cameroon, uh, presently the grants manager at Mad Sport Foundation and also a social entrepreneur, co-founder and president of Children's Fit in Cameroon. All right. So and I will end there for now. Yes. Okay. And she is in Cameroon, ladies and gentlemen. So like I like I said in the in when we were setting up everything, she's in between tea and, and dinner. Uh, the you know where as as we're recording this, so we appreciate her coming on as well. So, uh, Marta, I'm gonna start. Normally, what I do with guests is that you know at the beginning of the interview, I have a quote, and uh, the quote usually is related to something either they said, or something from a book they wrote, you know, some relating to the work that they do, right? So. Right. Your quote is the power of Haitian heritage and the strength of Haitian people is tremendous. And Haiti holds a unique and rich role in the history of African-Americans. What does that quote mean to you? It means basically like everything that we ever went through, you know, being a Haitian American you know, there's just a fight in us that we just don't stop. We keep going. We fight for what we believe in. You know, we're very proud people. Haitians are very, very proud people. And, you know, despite the constant battles that we go through, the hardships that we go through, the turmoil that we go through, we continue to keep going and we continue to just keep striving. And so I'm just, I'm very proud to be Haitian I'm very proud to have this blood running through my body because it just gives me motivation every day to continue to do the work that we're doing and just um, just really be super strong and transparent and, you know, just level headed. I, I really um, Haitians are we're really strong, powerful people. And, you know, our voices um, you know, mean something to the world, you know, mean something to the community, um, especially the black community. And I believe that, you know, there's a lot of similarities. I believe that, you know, we're all, we all come from, you know, the same mother, mother earth. Um, but at the same time, you know, I believe that, you know, something with African Americans and Haitians where we're very, very similar when it comes to, you know, our culture and just the way that we're so proud and the way that we speak and just everything. I saw. So that that's what that quote means to me. It's just being strong and, um, you know, despite the adversity and everything, just continuing to succeed and keep striving. Just very strong people. Us Haitians, we're just very, very strong people, strong-willed people, God-fearing people. And uh, so tell me a little bit about your story. How did you end up here um, and why you decided to start this organization? Yes. Um, so I am 27 years old. I am originally from St. Paul, Minnesota. A church uh, called Bethel Christian Fellowship Church went out to Haiti um, like over 20, 20 years ago. They did a missionary trip and they brought um, people to um, Minnesota from Haiti. And so my parents came here. Um, they had got their citizenship. And actually, my older brother, my older sister are was born in Port-au-Prince. So I'm literally the first generation here. And, you know, when we got here, you know, we were assigned to a family that was supposed to you know, help us uh, adjust to, you know, modern day society and things like that. 
but you know in, instead we were um not given those um not given the proper support you know as um you know my parents coming in as refugees you know the process getting their citizenship and things like that and so you know this put a lot of turmoil in my family a lot of stress in my family and um this caused um a lot of turmoil in my family and what ended up happening is i ended up going into the foster care system and when i was in the foster care system i also started to notice some of the adversity um some of the issues that were going on with other kids coming from a different culture um not knowing how to speak english well and you know just being taken advantage of in the system and you know this at a really young age just really um made me want to start asking questions and just noticing things going going on around me that I didn't necessarily agree with and when I was in foster care um you know the primary goal is to you know get the kids back with their parents and you know work on rec reconciliation and so what ended up happening is I was uh, 13 years old I was in foster care for a little over a year and when I was back home you know in our culture you know it's not good to speak on the family's business and things like that and so what ended up happening is I um my mom put me out and then I was on my own so I've been on my own since I was 13 and you know being 13 you know young age you know being in Minneapolis streets St Paul streets you could only imagine as a young female you know some of the things that I experienced and endured and you know at first it just started like going to friends house going to people's friends house sleeping here sleeping there but then I ended up finding a place called Youth Link, um, which is uh, a place for uh, homeless youth that they can go to and find resources. Well, when I went there, um, I told them what was going on and they helped me get into like transitional housing and things like that. And so while I was in school, I was living in this uh, transitional living program called I Die Young, which is a native based program. And from there, I started working different jobs. I started getting into healthcare first as a CNA, uh, PCA, things like that. And then I ended up um, graduating from high school. When I graduated high school, I decided to do home health aid. So I started to do home health aid. And then I wanted to get into like the mental health side of things. Um, so I started doing, um, started working for or a place called Enriched Living, where I worked with uh, youth that had been through um, chronic traumatic experiences. That was something that always interests me. So I started working with um, the youth um, that I were dealing with uh, chronic mental health issues. Um, and then fast forward, um, I ended up you know, started to talk with my case manager at the time where, where I was um, a part of this program called Youth Link. And I started to say to myself and to her, you know, I don't want to be in this position, you know, where I'm relying on the government because around this time I was working these different jobs. I was in subsidized housing. So after I left, I die young. Um, I started to do the subsidized housing, which is like um, something where they take like 30% of your income and, but you're still not really fully on your own. And so, you know, in my early twenties, I said to myself, Hey, you know, I want to start being more independent, um, you know, paying full rent and being on my own and graduating, you know, from this program. And so, you know, after enriched living, I actually moved to Milwaukee and um, when I moved to Milwaukee, I started to work for uh, the government, the housing authority, uh, city of Milwaukee as an intake specialist. And this was super interesting to me because I went from, you know, myself being in subsidized housing, being on food stamps and things like that, and working part-time jobs to now 
you know, working for the local government in Milwaukee and, you know, seeing the backside of that, you know, helping people get the things that they need in order to get approved or denied, you know, for housing and things like that, which was super interesting for me. And then when I moved back to Minnesota, I did the same thing, but instead of doing um, the intake specialist and like the corporate side of the things, I was just cooking and cleaning for different residents um, at different projects um, and uh, cooking for them, cleaning for them and organizing uh, their daily programs. So um, each day I would do about 60, 60 people a day. I was feeding 60 people a day and um, again, um, uh, cleaning for them and things like that. And then, you know, I just decided that I wanted to start more of an entrepreneurship. So this was around probably um, 2000, 2019, 2020. I had went and made uh, this, or this place called a Happy Healthy Healing. And it was like a soap making thing. And this was right around after the pandemic. And, um, you know, a lot of women um, were talking to me and telling me some of the things that they were going through during the pandemic. And, you know, me making the soaps, it just made me want to do one, one, two things. I wanted to create something that was like more of a holistic healing approach because in the Haitian culture, um, one of the herbs that are important to us is cloves. And so I had made like a clove oil infused based um, soap. And so I wanted, you know, this soap had like anti-inflammatory, um, you know, components to it, you know, really healing soap. And so, you know, I kind of created this village of, you know, women on social media, on uh, Facebook, where I was going on live, talking to these different women. And then, um, you know, creating this LLC, Happy Healthy Healing, and selling the different soaps. And so, you know, I always uh, was more of uh, an entrepreneur. Um, but, you know, when I started doing the Happy Healthy Healing, that's when I really said to myself, okay, this is something that I want to continue to do. Um, is, you know, do this leadership, do more um, things where it's under my court, but I'm able to still help and support people the way I feel they need. And then, um, so I was doing that in Minnesota. And then fast forward, I had got married and um, my husband got an opportunity to work here in Atlanta, Georgia. And so we moved here and he started working and you know, when he first started working um, the first few months, you know, I kind of took a step back from my business. I kind of took a step back from um, everything and kind of just, you know, um, allowed myself to really figure out what I wanted to do here. Um, before we left, I was doing some motivational speaking to different schools about like my life and what I was going through and things like that. And so that was another thing, too, when I was doing um happy, healthy healing and everything that I was like, okay, you know, I'm doing the happy, healthy healing. You know, I'm talking to these different women. I have the support group on Facebook and then I'm going out to these different schools and talking to these different schools about my life. You know, I'm like, what do I do now? You know, being here in Atlanta. So, you know, months had passed by and I was just thinking and thinking to myself like, hey, you know, what am I going to do? And then I got a call from my mom. And when I spoke to my mom, she told me, my biological mom, and she told me that, you know, she had just got back from Haiti, that my parents were uh, building a house out there. And they went to go check on the house and see, you know, um, the last finishing touches of the house. And unfortunately, um, you know, they were just disturbed about, you know, all the things that were going on in Port-au-Prince, you know, such as, you know, the Haitian gangs. My mom was telling me she was seeing like bodies on the floor. My mom had to give her phone away to one of the locals there. And she was telling me how, you know, there were people that were coming to, um, you know, the United States, but, you know, either they were feeling discouraged or they weren't getting the proper support that they need. They were going back to Haiti. And so, I just, it just really frustrated me inside because 
I was hearing a lot of things in the news about Haiti, you know, these past few years, you know, if it wasn't about the earthquake or something going on with the president and now, you know, these Haitian gangs, but the fact that people were coming here, not feeling supported and going back to such a horrid um, situation, I felt really compelled to start this uh, organization. And so this past uh, July, I started the organization and, you know, I said, hey, you know, I can't do anything right now specifically in Haiti, but if I can do something here and be a safe haven here for people that, you know, come here, you know, that's what I want to do. And so, you know, our organization, you know, we provide resources to immigrants, to refugees. We want to help them with education. We want to help them with housing. You know, we want to help them with health, every aspect down to mental health. You know, we want to help um, these people. And that's really what started uh, my organization is, you know, that phone call that I got from my mom. And, you know, me just remembering as a, you know, young adolescent, some of the issues and problems that we were going through, not getting the proper care, the proper support and resources we need and how important that is. Um, and so, yeah, that 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 is what compelled me to start uh, my organization. And since then, I've been connecting with so many different people, you know, that have similar causes or, you know, different founders. And it just it, it has just been even though we've only been running for about almost seven months now, it has just been so amazing. And it, it's just it, you know the more days go on, the more and more that I learn more and more about different things about Haiti. And um, we're just, we're really, really excited about this. So now Tamia, you got brought into it. Tell us how you got involved with uh, Marta's foundation. Okay. Um, as the president of children's faith, I've been posting our our activities online. So the Ma Matt and I came in contact on LinkedIn when she was just about to get her organization registered. So she contacted me to also um, tell her more about my organization, what we did and my experiences and guide her through the process too. So it was just more like uh, an encouragement and kind of connection between her and I. And by the time she got registered, okay, she let me know that she had gotten uh, registered with uh, in the United States to continue helping homeless immigrant families. And this is almost the same thing I do here with uh, children and youths, mostly displaced uh, children and youths who are affected by the the Anglophone crisis in Cameroon that has been existing for over seven years, and also the Boko Haram insurgency that displaces over one million people within a year. So that is our visions kind of brought us together to come up with more ideas on how we can support each other to grow and create more impact in our communities. And since I had some experience in the field working with these youth because I've carried out uh, six uh, outreaches to displaced youth and also um, five empowerment workshops with youth and children in Cameroon who are actually displaced from the Northwest and Southwest regions of Cameroon. And we've also uh, partnered with different schools to help send these children who are not able to go back to school we send them back to school. So uh, Matt and I decided to come up with uh, a plan where we could help just share ideas, even though she's uh, working on, in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm here in Cameroon, how can we do to make this thing, this, this create a global impact? That is how we, we gathered our ideas she came to know about my training in project management and my experiences, seven years of experience working with uh, nonprofit organizations before I created mine. And my story 
the story behind my organization also touched her and she 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 agreed that we could go on a partnership so that we encourage each other yeah okay did are you still with us it sounds like she got cut off uh oh. marty you still here yes I'm okay here. yeah I, I think she got cut off on us um well while while she's gonna try to come back Okay. Let's talk about the study committee that was done in 2021. Because let's oh, try to get I'm, into something. I'm sorry. That's okay, Tamia. Um, uh, I, I was going to move on with uh, Marta about the uh, the study committee that happened in 2021. Uh, okay. Uh, it made some recommendations concerning immigrants, and two of them were removing unintended barriers to admissions at Georgia public colleges and investing in English learning. Now, you just got started, but, and this happened two years before you got started. Have you seen anything in the state of Georgia that would indicate that they are moving on those recommendations? You know, it's been so early that you know, I don't want to, I don't want to make a statement and then it not be correct. So right now I wouldn't know exactly how to answer that. But what I can say is, you know, the House of Representatives Study Committee on Innovative Ways to Maximize Global Talent, their reports, you know, um, the Martha Spot Foundation, we support their report and we want to continue to implement those ideas. So English learning, you know, that's going to be something that's going to be in our organization as well. Um, you know, child care, things like that. Um, education, again, that's something that's going to be in our organization. So we just, you know, um, we want to take this and we want to implement some of those things into our organization. But I don't want to say, you know, um, I've seen this or seen that and I haven't talked to enough people or, you know, we're so new. So I, I, I can't say. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I get that. Yeah, and that's, that's good. Uh, a decision for you to make. Uh, do you want to make a full assessment, but you, you basically have taken some points from that report and use that as part of your mission for the foundation. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's go. Cause I'm going to try to get as many questions as I can in, uh, okay. dealing with, um, uh, us CIS policy, uh, U- uh United States custom immigration services, uh, up to 300,000, 300, up to 30,000 non-citizens from Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Venezuela can come to the U S to seek a two year parole. I, I don't really like that word, but that's the legal term. But due to the volume of applicants, only half of that number uh, are randomly selected. So we're talking about 15,000 people. And unaccompanied minors cannot qualify unless their parent is already in the U.S. So in the work that you're doing in your experience, how much of a challenge is that toward, toward your work? You know, I don't think it's going to be much of a uh, challenge, but what I'm concerned about is when they get here is converting the job or whatever they were doing where they're from here in America. For example, we have a board member, his name is Benson. He recently just came from uh, Haiti and, you know, he's been a director of his own organization Um, in his own business for over 10 plus years. You know, he just came here to America and, you know, trying to find, you know, different jobs and different things that, you know, he wants to do. You know, one of our uh, conversations and, you know, something we were talking about is, you know, how do I get like licensing here? Or how do I get, you know, a director position or, you know, a job where it's tailored to his skills and his expertise and the work that he was doing in Haiti. And so, you know, I don't think it's an issue for, you know, um, those 15,000, you know, people to come here. I don't think that that part is an issue, but what I think is an issue is that, um, 
uh, not being able to convert properly um, their jobs and their expertise as he's having some difficulties and some issues with that. And and so your focus is to try to uh, help folks make that conversion. Yes. Okay. Um, another thing, uh, it says that recently it was discovered in Georgia that 1,790 children were reported missing while in state care between 2018 and 2022. Based on your personal experience and being in the foster system, uh, what are your specific concerns about this alarming news? My specific concerns is the fact that, you know, these kids have been abused, neglected, and, you know, anybody that knows, you know, and, you know, being a victim myself of abuse, of sexual assault and things like that, it puts us in a more vulnerable position and it puts us in a position where we're more susceptible to predators, to pimps, to sex traffickers, human traffickers and things like that. It's, it, you know, and so, you know, these kids already coming from, you know, such a, a hard place and coming here for refuge, coming here, um, you know, for help or, you know, being taken away from their families because abuse that was going on at home. It just really frustrates me, um, you know, that some of these kids are just, you know, missing through the cracks and we're not able to. um Uh, Marta, you um, still? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Hold on one second. I'm so sorry. Um, All right, Marta, while you're working on this, let me jump back to Tamia. Tamia, can you hear me? Is Tamia still there? Oh, yes, I can hear you. Okay. So, Tamia, while Marta's working on her issues, let me ask you this question. Yes. How many children do you deal with uh, at your at your uh, facility? Um, at Children's Fit, we have we presently have 52 registered kids with us um, whom we have successfully sent to school. You know, education in Cameroon is not free. Uh, so including uh, kindergarten and primary education. So we have successfully sent 52 to school. And then we have 200 other kids that we, that we just follow up in their different host communities. Most of them are either in orphanages or in um, foster care uh, homes. So I want to highlight something for the listeners. Now, you said there's about a million children that have been displaced in Cameroon due to conflicts and all this other stuff. And and you've been able to just deal with about two fifty. So that I just want to highlight that to show the magnitude of the problem. Uh, I want to commend you for doing what you can do, but it, it's it's a huge problem that we need to be focused on, not just in the United States but worldwide. Correct? Yes. Um, actually, the people that displace and I said. Uh, in, it was one million. That is generally not just children, but oh, okay. also okay. youth and yeah, yeah, and adults. Got you. Okay. So, but we have uh, fifty-one percent of this are youth and and children. That is why my focus is mostly on youth and children who displaced and they don't have where to live because we have a lot of street children now and kids who cannot go to school because their parents cannot afford to pay for their education. How much does it cost to go to school in Cameroon in U.S. dollars? Cameroon, I'm sorry, in U.S. dollars. Um, in U.S. dollars, government schools here, um, for the cost, we would have like 30, between 35 to $50 for primary education. That's for government schools. And then uh, for private schools, we have as from $200 uh, upward. 
Gotcha. Yeah, for secondary schools, we have between $75 to $150 for um, government schools. And private sections, we also have as from $200 of what, depending on the the private school. Yeah. So I can yeah. only imagine in your denomination, that's that's going to be a <laughs> lot of money. So I just, <laughs> you know, exactly. but, I, but I, I break it down. So if people want to contribute, and we'll get to that later on. Uh, just have what kind of cost you're dealing with as an organization. All right, Marta, are you back with us? Yes, yeah, I'm here. I'm oh, so sorry about that. That's okay. It's all right. It, it, it's kind of working out okay. So um, I want to get to one last question with you, Marta, and that's dealing with how you plan for your organization to coordinate with the uh, Department of Public Health's Refugee Health Program. Yes, what we want to do is we want to collaborate with them and we want to have, um, we want to be a part of the process. You know, our goal is to be a part of the process of, you know, when these people are coming here, helping them aid or helping them navigate or having a different perspective or input about how to, you know, help them. And so our goal is, you know, to one day be able to work with them. And, you know, the same way I was doing the work in um, Milwaukee, working with uh, each individual, seeing each family inf uh, information and what they need, doing the same thing with them as well. And so we want to be able to, you know, not only be an organization where we provide these services for refugees and immigrants, but also have a say and also have an input with other organizations or, you know, other companies that are also wanting to support or are already supporting refugees and immigrants. All right. So we're at that point of the program now where we get to plug stuff. So to me, I'm going to start with you. How can people uh, get in touch with you to make contributions to your organization to do the work that you're doing? Um, to, to make contributions to our organization, you can check on our website. There's a donate button there, um, www.childrensfit.org. www.childrensfit.org. You can either donate directly to Children's Feed Bank Account in Cameroon or through Remedly, which will come into, into my, my phone number and we issue a receipt. To the to the sponsor, and um, you can also check contact us through Facebook. We have a Facebook page called Children's Feet. Yes, you can click on the link, and you would see the different uh, information that is needed for you to donate to us. All right, Tamia. I mean, not Tamia. Uh, Marta, uh, how do people get in touch with you and and your foundation? You can um, message us on LinkedIn. You can reach us at www.tmsfinc.com. We're also on Instagram. We're on Facebook under TMSFINC. Right now, our main objective is to get more staff, more volunteers. So if anybody wants to volunteer, you can um, message us um, from directly from the website or you can get in touch with me on LinkedIn. All righty. Well, ladies, thank y'all for coming on. Uh, I hate that we only have a limited amount of time, uh, but I think we covered uh, the most important points, especially how to get in touch with y'all to get y'all some money right? To get y'all some donations to do the work. Because nonprofit work is, you know, it's hard. And, but if you, you know, in the spirit of what y'all are trying to do, uh, hopefully this podcast uh, will help y'all get some, some resources y'all need to continue to work. So Tamia, thank you for coming in from Cameroon. I appreciate you. Uh, thank you. Yes, ma'am. And, and, and Marta, thank you for for coming on the podcast and I, and I wish you a lot of uh, a lot of luck in 2024 and in, in, in building the organization the way you want to build it thank you so much Eric Fleming have a good year yes ma'am thank you so much Eric I have a good and wonderful end of year
Thank you. I man. hope to meet you one day. Yes, ma'am. When I get brave enough to travel the water, I'll 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 I'll, I'll do that. Uh, all right, guys. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. And we're gonna catch y'all on the other side. All right, and we are back. So to close this out, again, let me thank all my guests for coming on. I hope, again, that you were enlightened and inspired by these guests. And I really, really hope that individually, each and every one of you that listen to the podcast have a prosperous, glorious new year. Uh, We know that it's going to be some challenges And the role of this podcast is to address those challenges, face them head on and and overcome them. And with your help and continue to support, we're going to do that on our end. Um, Again, I'm not doing a lot of hot mics or whatever, because we have been blessed to have guests coming on. And and we hope that continues throughout the year. But if you do want to hear commentary from me about certain things that are going on, please go to my Patreon page, patreon.com slash a moment with Eric Fleming. Uh, Subscribe to the podcast, support the podcast in that way, as well as just listening. Uh, Again, Happy New Year, everybody. And until next time. (music) 